Welcome to today's presentation, an introduction to the science of the positive, the first webinar in the social norms webinar series, using the science of the positive to increase your community impact. We would like to note that today's presentation is provided free of charge and is available in the public domain. Also, the information presented today are the views and opinions of Dr. Jeff Linkenbach and do not reflect the official position of HHS or SAMHSA. Please let us know if you have any questions about the information in this disclaimer. We would like to welcome our presenter, Dr. Jeff Linkenbach. As the director of Director and Research Scientist at the Montana Institute, Dr. Jeff Linkenbach has developed national award-winning programs that change community norms. Jeff holds a Doctor of Education with a focus on community education, a master's degree in counseling, and has over the past 30 years of experience in various fields of public health leadership. Jeff created the National Conference on the Social Norms Approach to Prevention in 1998 in Big Sky, Montana which has since transformed into the renowned Montana Summer Institute on Positive Community Norms. Jeff also founded the Center for the Health and Safety Culture at the Western Transportation Institute and is the developer of the Science of the Positive and Positive Community Norms frameworks, which have been utilized by tribal, federal, state, and local organizations to achieve positive change and transformation around issues such as child maltreatment, substance abuse, suicide, and traffic safety. He has been leading positive community norms implementation with Minnesota communities through the state of Minnesota for the past 15 years, which has resulted in significant reductions in teen alcohol and other substance abuse. We're very excited to welcome Dr. Jeff Linkenbach today. We will post a full a link to Dr. Linkenbach's bio in the chat. I'll turn the time over to you, Jeff. Thanks, Taylor, and thank you everybody for taking time today. Um, what a great turnout and um, I'm honored to have this opportunity to present. I realize that all of you are engaged in various aspects of, of prevention, treatment, education, um, health promotion. It, it's my hope that there'll be some elements of what we talk about today that you're able to take and, and think about and deepen your work, um, deepen the mystery and the beauty of, of, of the work you do. In the chat box, if you would, flood the chat box, people. We're gonna do this several times. What's something positive that you've experienced in the, in the last 48 hours? What's something positive that you've experienced in the last 48 hours. I'm not gonna be able to read all of these, but I wanna um, look at puppy snuggles. Okay, that, that already took the, the lot right there. Church, family interaction, dinner with friends, quality time with family, a sunrise, a hug from your six-year-old niece. I love that. Um, family time. Um, and um, again, lots of family time showing up, good food, rollerblading, Rachel, I love that, napping, Tiffany, I'm right there, um, the outdoors, cooking with your son, uh, feeling the sun on your skin, um, your partner made you dinner, love it. The hummingbirds came to Teresa's bird feeder, that is beautiful. Um, there's so much joy here, so much positivity. Finding a new therapist, wonderful, that's huge. A kind waitress, kindness, nice dinner, uh, winning a softball game, um, going to the driving range, time to exercise. Listen to the, the quality of these. Often they're outdoors, they're activities, they're all positive. Many are connected with um, family, loved ones, partners, friends nature, lots of nature. Um, so uh, watching baby birds, um, people offering sympathy for, for a loss in, in the family. So sometimes positive is, is there amidst grief as well. Uh, mountain biking, sunsets, a good night's sleep. You all can scroll through these as well. 
Uh, more hummingbirds. I love it. Um, we're being visited by hummingbirds today. And ice cream, grandchildren. These are beautiful people. Thank you. It's also by um, design. It's very strategic that we, we start this way. I'm going to unpack some of this. The, the brain science and, and our experience with our work with the science of the positive shows that if, if we can start and light up um, that part of our brain that's looking at things from a, a positive, hopeful perspective, we're going to see data in a new light. We're going to see things that we may not see if we're only looking through that myopic lens of, of, of fear or concern. So, so thank you. It's by design that we always start with something like this. And we do this with all of our, our prevention work. Here's some of what we're going to cover today. I want you to experience some of the energy of this, this framework, uh, the science of the positive framework. <clears throat> At the heart of this is what we call the cycle of transformation. We're going to unpack some of that. We're going to engage and integrate some new ideas, and we're going to reflect on, on things that, that we're learning. Please feel free to visit our website. There's um, many different materials that we have. I'm also uh, comfortable, uh, Taylor, Rory, um, anything I mentioned today too, I'm happy to fire over um, your direction so the PTTCs can, can uh, put these on, on your sites as, as well. We also, um, Rory, if you don't mind maybe putting this um, link into the, the chat box, we continue to solicit information from um, folks in terms of what are some of the types of trainings and things um, that you'd like to get more of. And we especially like opportunities like this one where we can partner and then bring that through uh, the, the PTTC. But here are some of those kinds of examples of some of the, the different types of trainings that people are requesting more of. Over this, we're in a three-part series. I'm gonna unpack the science of the positive framework, the, the real understanding and the core of this work and then over the next two, it's gonna unpack and, and go deeper into positive community norms and the seven steps and how do we actually do this in, in our, our communities. How many people have seen posters like this that somehow, it may not be this one, but of course, but that promote a norm. How many people have seen something like this that promotes a, a, a positive norm? Just type in a yes or no in the, in the chat box. I'm just curious to see what um, some of the kinds of expectations. Oh, this is great. Uh, lots of people um, un understanding, having seen this, that this is great. <clears throat> um, you know, 25 years ago when we were first starting out and doing normative work, primarily on college campuses where we developed it, we would not have had so many yeses. People be like, what's that? That's, that's weird, that's different. Um, and so um, it's great to see so many have. This is an example of a norms message. This, would, this was actually a, a billboard uh, in a community, Austin, Minnesota. And we're gonna work our way towards, why would you have a message like this? Why would you do something like this? Today is gonna unpack a lot of the understanding behind that. And then the next couple of times we'll go into more depth as to some of the specifics of, of what and how to do that. I want to back up though about 30 years to a time when I was working in northern Colorado and I was actually uh, in, in a treatment setting. I, I was a um, substance abuse um, treatment counselor and we go out into the schools and, and take our pre prevention messages out into the classrooms and at that time the best we had, let's call it the best practices, that, that we had was to basically go out and educate people on all the, the scary, harmful things that could happen to them. We're talking young people at this point, you know, teens, all the scary, ugly things, the pharmacology that could happen to them if, if they engaged in substances. And that was our, our prevention is don't do this. It was at that time, a, a young man stood up in the back of the classroom and he basically just said, Dude, that's not who we are. And he was reacting to me, painting a picture of all of them of being youth at risk, right? 
And I, I was using that term, that's, that's the term we used quite a bit at that time. Many of you might remember that. Um, but he reacted real strong because the, the picture that I was painting of him and his generation of being the, the, of me assuming that the majority of them were engaging in high risk behaviors, he stood up and reacted very strong against that. Again, at the time, those were our best practices. They were really coming from what we, we talk about now as deficit models, meaning we think they didn't have enough esteem. So we'd fill them with esteem. They didn't have enough education. So we, we thought our job was to fill them with education. They didn't have enough fear of, of what was going on if they engaged in substances. So we'd try to fill them with fear, right? Um, it was kind of the don't run with sharp scissors approach to prevention. And I moved on from that role into working in um, with binge drinking prevention in, in, in college campuses, uh, which was and is a, a serious issue. And I think all of you get that. But we used the same approach. We, we thought, okay, let's come in and let's increase the amount of awareness of fear and harm. And guess what happened? Binge drinking rates actually went up on these campuses where those of us that were doing this work funded by US Department of Ed primarily, we would go out and promote harmful risks, harmful norms and tell people to avoid it, but the drinking rates went up. And this really caused us to start reconsidering what was going on. Since then, there's been decades of research talking about how using scare tactics, trying to scare the health into young people doesn't work. In fact, it, it can have iatrogenic or reverse effects, right? We could actually be prescribing the harm. And there's a lot of reasons why this occurs. The bottom line is that fear appeals, you know, trying to scare an audience is not as effective as, as using other strategies. Let me clarify something though. This isn't to say that we don't need to get accurate information about risk information out. Of course we do. It doesn't have to be delivered in terms of fear though. It doesn't have to be delivered in terms of shame. And that's one of the biggest problems we have with fear-based approaches is they really start to create a drumbeat of shame. And then with shame comes stigma and they just are not as effective. And when we start to use these approaches, we can get all sorts of unwanted effects similar to what you're seeing on the screen. It can label or stigmatize people. They, they, they feel pushed out. It can actually expand different gaps, social gaps, um, equity gaps, promote poor health as a, as a value. The very thing that we're trying to have people avoid, they start, they start to see more and more. And it, it really starts to distort views and, and create misperceptions of norms. So there's there's all sorts of ick that starts to come along with it. One of my papers I wrote, we talk about what's called cultural cataracts, meaning as a, as a culture, we, we have these dark lenses of how we see young people in, um, in the environment. And so if we're starting to see them only as youth at risk, no wonder that young man spoke up in, in the way that he, he did. So the bottom line of, of what we've learned um, with our work and many others over, over these past several decades, and I think many of you, is if we want health, we actually need to promote health. I'm just going to say that again. If we want health, we need to promote health. We don't promote avoiding unhealth. We actually need to promote health. So tell me in the chat box now again, what are some of your thoughts about moving beyond fearful messages? With, I just kind of threw some stuff right out there at you, right here at the beginning. And I'd be curious some of your, your reactions. Um, go ahead and just use the, um, the, the chat box if you would. So thanks folks. Um, yeah, we've come a long way. Thanks Robert from, from just say no. And at the time that made sense at, at the time but we have evolved and the science has evolved. Um, I love that, I agree, Colleen, that the young man speaking up um, was, um, was, was really important, really courageous. It was a life-changing moment for me 
I have to say that being confronted in front of a classroom of, of his peers. And he was right. He's right. Yeah. And it's, it's time. I agree. Lots of people saying, I love it. Uh, thanks, Stephen. You're positive about it. Well, well stated. Boom. Drop the mic. Right. Yeah. Let's, let's do the research. Um, uh, the research is showing let's focus on the positive and it makes sense. It's intuitive. Um, yeah, and the stigma is dangerous. Um, it doesn't work for many people. Um, you're, you're right. And kindness matters. Um, and it is challenging to change others' beliefs about it, Sarah. Thank you. Yeah, we're talking about a, a, a culture and some patterns here um, that are entrenched. And this is our work. Um, and um, gosh, these are great comments, people. I, I love what you're saying, um, promoting uh, the positive, promoting fun, promoting engaging, um, and it misdirects the focus. Yeah, absolutely. And, and many more comments as well. So thank you all. Thank you. And again, I'm going to underline this, what I said. This does not mean that we get away with talking about or educating people about risks. That's still very important. It just doesn't need to be done amidst a climate of shame and fear. There's other ways that we, we can do that. So, so thank you. So I wanna unpack something that's right at the center of our work with the science of the positive, and it's gonna be right at the center of the work that we do with positive community norms as we engage in this three-part series. It's called the cycle of transformation. This is something that I'm hoping you could for those of you that want, you could take and put into action immediately, okay? And so, but to start this off, I, I, I wanna say Dr. King in this beautiful, powerful, famous speech said what? I have a, go ahead and throw it in the chat box, people. I have a what? Come on. I just need to keep you with me here. And you are, I love this interaction. Look at you people. Dream, oh my gosh. See, I had a different script that I read. I, I had read that he had a seven step strategic framework. It's evidence-based, it's comprehensive, it's multifaceted, works across a social ecological continuum. Well, maybe that wasn't his speech. Maybe, maybe I have a dream was actually what he said. Why do I say this? Tongue in cheek, couple things. First of all, he actually did rewrite this speech the night before. He originally had started with something much more heady and um, strategic, and then he rewrote it. And then he came from his heart. He spoke from his heart and he said, I have a dream. There's something really powerful with frameworks that can, can operate in this way. And so we're going to talk about the unpacking of this framework in the science of the positive the cycle of transformation, we always start from the heart. We're gonna start spirit first. Then we'll move into the science, the action and the return. We start from spirit, it's a place of positivity. That's what we did and we're doing this morning. It's a place of hope and affirmation. What's working well? It's energy giving. People lean into that kind of a positive spirit. Then we engage the science, the evidence, the assessment, the data, the strategy. And then we're going to engage in different actions, the best practices, right? The um, evidence base or science informed. And then we come around to a place of return, outcomes, effectiveness. How's this working? Reflections. We always engage in this way. We go spirit, science, action, return. And so this is how we would set up our work in, in looking at a new project or looking at a, a campaign a norms campaign or other type of campaign. We say spirit, what, you know, what's gonna be the spirit or the tone of the work? How will we approach the science? What will our actions be? And, and what are the returns we seek? We're gonna start off asking these kinds of questions, but to not be presumptuous here that we all have the same definition of these words, I wanna take a moment and unpack these. And so we're gonna do a little activity if we were all in the same room, you'd have these worksheets on your tables, right? Um, and I would give the exact same instructions I'm gonna to give to you now. And I'm gonna say, okay, I want you to flood your worksheet 
with as many synonyms or words that are similar that have us that are associated with each of these four domains. So let's start right now together with with the word spirit in the chat box, if you would. What are words that come to mind for you um, that that are synonymous with with spirit? Let, let's start there. This is great. Vibe, attitude. Um, keep going, gang. Words, heart, heart. Um, pep. I love that. Philosophy. Um, yeah. Um, God, heart, soul, empowerment. Listen to the power of these words. The energy, self, compassion, motivation. Um, Oh my gosh, these are great people. Um, inner strength, being supportive, drive, love it. These are awesome. Let's do the same thing now. And let's talk about words for science. What are some words that you have for, for science? Um, when, you, when you think of science words, um, what, what, comes, what comes to you? Let, let's jump in. Oh my gosh, look at the chat box. Just ping here. Yeah, this is great. Facts, proof, knowledge, logic, um, um, lots of lo logic, um, sound, solid, facts. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Um, look at all these. You all can see it too. Um, in fact, it's so much my, I'm having trouble managing my, my cursor on the, on the chat box. This, this is fantastic. Um, cool. So, um, Researched, evidence-based, evolves, love it. Okay, let's take a look now at um, words associated with, um, with action. What are some of the different words that you have that you think of when you think of action? What are action words? Movement, collaboration, um, yeah. Um, doing, movement, movement, inform. Keep them coming, people. Create progress, motivation, partnerships, uh, community efforts, practice, engaged, moving, action, strategies, youth, sectors, taking charge, decisions. Love it. Flow, equity. All right, same thing now for return. What are some words that you would associate with um, return? I loved all of us too. Reflect, outcome results, um, coming back. Um, I once was doing this with a group and they said, Walmart. And I'm like, what? Yeah, you can return anything you need to to Walmart if you don't like it after you buy it. So everyone laughed. Coming back, improvement, awareness, social capital. Virginia, I love that. Um, if, yeah, this is, this is great. Celebration, reflection, feedback loop, growth. You people are on it. This, this is great. I, I love it. Thank you so much for, for doing this. So yeah, so these are some of the different associated words when we think of spirit, science, action, return. So let's look at what this looks like when we start to operationalize this a bit. So we say, so what's going to be the spirit of the work, right? What's going to be the tone, the energy? Well, this is, a, this is an example, kind of a compare contrast. On the left, there's a, there's a spirit. Without even reading the text, what are some words that come to you in terms of the tone or the spirit that, that's communicated from the image, just from that image, people? What are some things that, that come to you looking at um, the, the image on the left? What are emotional words or the spirit of the tone that, that you would see here? What, what are some things that you see? Go ahead and use the chat box if, if you would. Um, yeah, so you don't want to look at the one on the left. Interesting. I, I know what you mean. Thank you. And, and young people will say the exact same thing. Our audience will. Pain, not like me, disheartening. Don't want to be that sadness, scary, negative, lost, hurt, right? Shame. Yeah. Listen to these words. These, if, if we're talking about spirit first, the spirit of an image communicates something right away. And listen to how we're reacting. 
many of our audience would react this way too with the avoidance, the sad, the regret. Um, what about on the right? What are some words in terms of the spirit or the tone of the image on the right? What would be words that you would have for this one? Um, so closeness, go ahead and, uh, yeah, go ahead and keep mentioning in, in the chat box. What are some other things you have on, on the right? So we've got, we've got closeness, we've got um, love, caring, support. Um, what else do you have? What else are you seeing here? These are coming in so fast. I love it, people. These are great. Um, love, care, support, connection, inclusion, um, clean, safe, love, safety, happy future, hope, bond. Listen to these words. So important. Healthy. Yeah. So when we when we think about um, the difference of the spirit or the tone that we set up, that it's quite palatable. So what does this mean? Well, one of the things is, you notice how when you see a pattern, you start to see it everywhere, right? Or you see that it's been around for quite a long time, right? That's something that I've noticed with, with this cycle too, that the spirit science action return have, have been with us in all sorts of formats and um, in, in a lot of ways. Here's a community uh, in one of the Minnesota communities we worked with in the past. Look how they incorporated all four of these. Yes, you're going to get these images. You're going to get these PDFs. So don't have to scribble like crazy. Just be with us and experience this. Look at the spirit. Let's just walk through this for, for a second. You got the spirit or this tone of gratitude. Hey, thanks, parents, right? Anytime we thank an audience, thank a group of people that we're serving, that's an important, powerful spirit. The science here is a science of norms, right? A 93% is a very strong norm. Uh, the action being very clear, not drink, not drink alcohol. And um, the, the return here in this case being the, the time frame, mon monthly prevalence um, thereof. So here's an example of bang, just on one bus that they wrapped, how all of these, these would show up. The, the wording here is hard to see. Um, it's blurry and blown up, but I wanted you to see, we did a climate, we were working on a climate change initiative um, in, in Australia and same thing. They, unpacked it in this same way, meaning all sorts of campaigns with different issues can, can use the same approach. We teach the coalitions that we serve how to do this in every one of their meetings as well. There can be this, this spirit or this tone that we set at the beginning of the meeting. Then we go into the science or the, the strategy, the data um, in the meeting. Then then we get into the specific of the actions. And then for, for what kind of return? Okay, what, what did we want out of this? What are we gonna do next? What's coming up, right? So we will put this into practice in all sorts of ways. I had the opportunity of working with the CDC over the years around child maltreatment prevention and norms. And um, we, we were looking at norms change issues. And that was one of their goals for, for creating um, healthy childhood environments, but look at how they, with their four goals, did the same thing with the spirit, the science, the action, the return. So we strategically use this in, in, in many different ways. What's something you may have learned from this activity? Just give you an opportunity to, to reflect back. Is there anything that kind of sticks out to you with this, um, th this activity? Just give you a moment in the chat box if you want. Yeah, the, the positive agenda. Um, I like that too. It's, it's, it's nice to be a part of that. And it is universal. I agree. This is something that we can use in many different ways. It's very simple. It's very simple. And yet it's very powerful and very strategic, isn't it, folks? Um, yeah, there's so much we can do here um, and see how that we can present and work with this. Um, 
I love it with the four walks of life. Um, some people making some native connections there. A lot of my native friends and colleagues, uh, indigenous people have, have seen the, the world in four directions for many, many generations. Yeah, and it is cultural. Um, um, and so, um, so anyways, this, thank you. This is uh, um, real, real helpful for, for me checking in with you in that way. Here's what I wanna do. I wanna unpack some of the essence of the science of the positive so that you're seeing how this works and, and from the kind of the center outward. And then as we continue forward over these next few weeks and our work together, I'm hoping you'll have some of the ahas about how all of these, these pieces really fit together. So I wanna talk about what's at the core. And what I wanna do, I'm gonna bring up a next word. And as soon as you see the word, um, be on mute, go ahead and scream it out in your office if you want and type it into the chat box, okay? I'm gonna go give you three seconds. I'm gonna have you type in the word, ready? Three, two, one. What's the word you see? Type it in, yell it. What is the word, people? What are you seeing? This is great. Um, yeah, so go ahead. So we're seeing lots of uh, nowheres. We're seeing a few now here's um, mostly um, nowheres. Oh my gosh, look at all of you. This is great. Um, so many being flooding um, um, the, the chat box. This is great. And it's mixed, it's mixed. I, I love what, what's going on here with this too. And so um, one of the things that, um, that we have to ask is which is it? So which is it? Is it now here or is it nowhere? Well, it could be either, right? Right, it could, it could be either, depending on where we're coming from. So much of this work that we're doing in, in, in prevention, prevention science is about us as, as leaders. So um, we already kind of answered this, you know, which did you see first? Was it now here or nowhere? You, you already answered that. It could be either depending on, on where we're coming from. So this is why it's important to start, examine our core assumption. Albert Einstein was interviewed once and in, uh, for, um, by a newspaper reporter. And the reporter said, Dr. Einstein, you know, what's the most important next question we should be asking you know, as, in terms of science, in terms of physics? And, and Einstein answered um, and would, would, had pondered this and, and you know, for facing humanity today, what's the most important question we should be asking? And this was his response. Dr. Einstein said, the next question we should ask is whether or not the universe is a friendly place. Whether or not the universe is a friendly place. He went on to explain that the reason this is important is because how we provide the answer to this question really sets up what we're gonna see. So if we see the universe as, as scary, evil, dangerous, out to get us, we're gonna set up defense mechanisms and defense systems um, to, to protect ourselves from that, that harm. But if we see the universe as friendly or kind, benevolent, uh, working with us, we're gonna lean forward and engage in the universe in, in a different way. And I think this is, this is critical for our own core assumptions. When we look at what, what is central to our belief system, personally, but here we're talking professionally, what is that core assumption at, at the center of all our beliefs? So I define a core assumption as this root assumption that's like the tap root. You can peel back layers of thoughts and ideas and perceptions and you could get to this core assumption, this tap root from which everything else springs. And the core assumption for us, the work we do with the science of the positive is that the positive is real. It's, it's worth growing. Um, there's a value. So the positive is real. It's not just this idea, but there's something real about it 
that's worth investing, investing our, our resources, our lives, our conversations, our public narratives, our public policies, and that we can spread and expand this through environmental strategies, through education, through all sorts of ways. But it all starts with this core assumption, the positive is real, it's here, it exists. And, and, and we could spread that. I know some of you are now thinking I'm heading into woo-woo land of, uh, of wanting to go here, which I actually am, I'd love it. Um, if, if we could follow some other countries as, that have put um, happiness as, as one of their indicators um, of instead of just GDP, there's, there's other measures of, of wealth um, beyond that. Some of you are thinking it's fluff. I, I understand, but what we've got is a lot of science now around the positive that isn't merely fluff. This isn't just happy thoughts, right? Happy posters, right? There's a lot more going on here. And um, th what that means is we're really looking at transforming systems because a lot of our systems are not geared up to just jump right into the, the focus of a science of the positive. They, a lot of our systems we mentioned earlier are still many are still focused on like the, the fear-based, right? Um, so so what's, what's your core assumption? I'd, I'd be curious in the, in the chat box to, to look at some of what, what, what's your core assumption? What, what's some things that, that you think about? I'd, I'd be real curious here. If you don't mind, jump in and, and mention some of these. Um, I do like fluffier, nuttier sandwiches. Those are really, um, those are good. What are some of your core assumptions? My screen is, is doing a little freeze mode here. So I'm actually not able to read these and, and scroll at the moment. Um, The people want to change, healthy community, love and healing, that love can heal. Um, this is great. People are doing the best that they can. Um, being an eternal optimist, people caring, positivity, that love is all around and we can connect through a sense of goodness and making a difference in your community. Love it, Marla. That there is good in people. So many of our youth, we do this same activity with young people. That's what they say too. I'm so hopeful with our younger generation uh, because they get this. I love it that recovery happens. People are helping people in communities, healthy relationships. Absolutely. Um, everyone, is a child of God, hope springs eternal, kindness, acceptance, love. Um, th th this is great. So, so thank you so much. So as we unpack this then, in our work with the science of the positive, it's really the study of how positive factors impact us as cultures and our individual experience. And so we're gonna focus on how to measure and grow the positive. It's based on this core assumption that the positive is real, that it's worth growing, worth spreading in ourselves and our communities and the people that we serve. And so this is at the heart of, of all the, the work we do. So we intentionally start there. This is one of the graphics of our, our framework. We're not gonna go through all these elements, but I want you to see that we, we, what we have covered, we start at the center with the positive Right? We start with the positive and, and then we start to make that happen. How do we make that happen? Through that cycle of transformation, spirit, science, action, return. That is an important way that we grow the positive. Then there's these other steps and, um, and principles and other elements that we get into as we go into deeper elements of, of the training in terms of how we welcome the positive and what we look at for and in the data for seeing the positive in data, um, correcting vision, uh, misperceptions. There's all these other elements, but I wanted you to see that the heart of it 
is we start with the positive and then we go spirit, science, action, return. So everything starts with this core assumption. And then from that, we realize that the solutions to whatever challenges that we're, we're facing, problems, challenges, they already exist in our communities. I'm going to say that again. The solution is already in community. It's in bringing people together. It's not us bringing a solution to a community. It's in the process of community itself. That's how the positive starts to, to show up. And so this gets really exciting for the work we can do then in looking at this. So we're talking about what I'd call the green arrow. We're talking about protections and what we know from public health, um, the public health approach looks at both risk and protection, right? We're gonna reduce the red arrow, we're gonna reduce the risk and we're gonna increase the, the positives. We're gonna increase the protection. In the science of the positive, we look at that in terms of hope and concern. We're gonna grow the hopes, we're gonna grow the green arrow and we're gonna reduce the, the concerns. So what's this green arrow? So in a lot of our communities and depending on the different issues we focus on, and I believe in, you know, in this, the majority of us are obviously focusing with substance abuse prevention as, a, as an issue. And we focus on many other important related issues, child maltreatment prevention, um, violence, dating violence, family violence. Um, there's a number of other issues that, that are associated. And a lot of times it feels like what we're dealing with is this dark sky of, of you know, oppressive factors that, that we'll never overcome. And yet our job is to bring that sense of hope. In fact, I'd like to challenge each of us in our thinking that I think that is one of the central elements of what we do is we're here to bring hope hope to the people that we work with and the communities we serve. And as transformational leaders, we can create conditions in the environment to allow the positive to emerge. That's what an environmental approach does, right? It doesn't just educate individuals. It goes beyond that to creating conditions in the environment so that the, the, the positive can emerge. So moving from this public health approach and the science of the positive, we can start to look at data differently. Here's a first little clip into looking at norms. So the exact same data set, this just happens to be Minnesota, but it could be um, any one of your states outside of Minnesota as well. Um, we could look at the data in a traditional way. Just take the, the one on the, the, the top. We could look at the fact that 8% of eighth graders had used alcohol in the previous 30 days. And that's, and that's very concerning. And at the same time, we could look at the green arrow where we could see that 92% of these folks have not engaged in any alcohol use in that time frame, or move on up through the other grades. Bottom line is we can look at the red arrow or we could look at the green arrow. Both are real, both exist. The data just are, they're not high or low or right or wrong. Our work as prevention leaders is to be able to interact with the data in a way that we can present the data to our audiences to get the most impact, right? Um, there are audiences that we're gonna wanna focus on the red arrow, but the majority of our audiences, we're gonna wanna focus on the, the green arrow. We're gonna wanna promote that positive norm. We're gonna wanna promote um, the strength and the resilience. So we're gonna ask, are we getting the results we want? Are we growing these green arrows? And I wanna ask you, you know, what is in your green arrow? We, if we wanna grow the goodness that already exists in our community, there's already protections, there's already strengths. What is it that you wanna grow in your community? Go ahead and use the chat box again. What are some of the green arrow elements that, that you would like to grow? Go ahead and um, again, yeah, you could use the, um, the, the chat and um, this is great. Engagement. Um, yeah, the good point about the parents. Some parents think their kid is in the 92% and most would be correct if they saw that. And that's a good thing. We want parents to see that most young people 
are engaging in protective behaviors and that they expect their child to be joining that positive norm. So we're looking at choices, strong families, positive activities for all ages. Um, oh, this is great. Um, getting some really, really powerful um, responses. Yeah, youth engagement and local issues, connections with adults, positive behavior, optimism. Hear the language here, people, that you are awesome. These are all green arrow examples. These could be measured. These could be grown. These could be expanded. These are based on that core assumption that these already exist, right? So this is great. This is, and this is an important activity because it changes our narrative as a coalition. It shifts our narrative in our community to be introducing and talking about how we are the, the, the people that have help with um, positive emotional supports. And we're the people that um, create conditions to support mental well being, right? We're the people that create positive experiences. Think, hear how I'm saying that. It's different than saying, hi, we're here to reduce all these problems. We're here to prevent all the red arrows. You can still be that. And listen to the power if we present ourselves. From, from this positive green arrow perspective. So um, th this is great in terms of what it is we, we, we wanna grow in, in our community. I'm gonna go ahead and just um, keep us rolling here. Um, I wanna do a quick introduction of the positive community norms framework. This starts to, to move then. So going from this question of, are we getting the results that we want and, and looking at increasing positive community norms. I wanna say that at the heart of public health, that has always been one of the aims using environmental strategies, education, uh, impacting uh, at the societal and policy level. We're trying to grow the green arrow. We're trying to increase positive community norms. Now let's build on what we've started here. So we know that we have the spirit, science, action, and return. So here's the basic logic of how this will unpack, right? The spirit, science, action, return. We always operate in, in that way. So this is a very simple logic model then for positive community norms where we're gonna focus on and uncover the positive. The positive is often um, covered up by, by different things, misperceptions are often one of the ways. And we're gonna measure the gaps with these misperceptions. We're gonna, public health is also all about gaps, looking at um, gaps in terms of health equities and, and different types of disparities. We're gonna measure gaps. And we're gonna challenge the misperceptions around those gaps in, in some very effective ways as a way to increase health, as a way to grow the, the green arrow. In the next couple of weeks, we'll unpack more about the positive community norms approach. You'll see similarities with the science of the positive framework. But the bottom line of what we're doing is we're starting with that, that green arrow in the center here of looking at the positive norms and then use following through this logic model with these, these different steps, steps that'll look really familiar to you with whatever type of framework you may be working with in terms of assessing um, and, and looking at the data and then developing strategic ways of um, growing health. So I wanted to focus more on looking at, so what's a norm, right? Um, okay, now that, that really dates me, I get it. Let, wait, let me be more current. Okay, now, now we got a new norm. Okay, I'm still outdated, all right. So what's a norm? Social norms are, perceived standards, right, of what's acceptable or unacceptable in terms of attitudes or behaviors that's most prevalent. So what's okay or not okay? What, what people should or shouldn't do? What are most people doing and is it acceptable, right? So one of the ways that we can quantify a norm is, is to take a look at, um, it is to take a look at statistically, what, what does this look like? And so it would be above 
If it's 50%, it's half. If it's below 50%, it could be a lot. It could be a sum. But when we're talking about above 50%, that's when we get into being a norm. Anything hovering around 50%, 51% or so, it's pretty weak norm. Something up around 99% is a strong norm. And here's some of the language that comes out with norms. You know, we talk about the majority of people, what's most typical, what most teens are doing, what almost all adults in the community support. That's how it would show up in terms of the, the language with, with the norm. Here's some data with uh, prescription drug use and high school students. Here we go again. Look at how we've got a green arrow in the bottom, the 82%, right? And, um, and then we'd have the red arrow or the 18% up, up top, right? So both exist. I wanna be clear on something. We don't just celebrate and say, okay, we're done. Yay, we got 82%. Of course not. The fact that 18% about 18% have engaged in this, this really troubling high-risk behavior it is a real concern. Hope and concern live side by side, and we need to be working with both. But I wanted to show you how you can always start to look at your data and, and start to look at a, another frame too. Here's some examples, again, from Minnesota, but what I wanted you to see was look at the each of these on the left side is a norm because they're above 51%, they're above 50%, right? So this is down at the bottom, the 93% is a stronger norm than the 75, yet these are all norms, okay? What different norms theories do, different social norms theories do, is they typically look at this gap between what's really going on, what's called the actual norm or the true norm, and what the audience perceives is going on, the perceived norm. And there's often a huge gap. And this gap gives us the energy where we direct our attention and our intervention. So when we're talking about the actual norm, it's what's really going on, what most people hold as a belief or an attitude or what most people do, that'd be the actual norm. The perceived norm is what we think think most people think or what we think most people are doing. These are the two very different constructs. So what's the true norm here? What's the norm in central Montana, in Rudyard, Montana? What, what's the norm here, people? What, what, do, you, um, what do you perceive as, as the norm? You go ahead and chatter up again. You get it, yeah. Right? What, what's the norm? Nice people, we get it. And, and what is outside of the norm? What, what's, yeah, the sore head, right? Exactly, you all get this, yeah. Okay, so if the media were to descend on, um, on this poor little town in central Montana, what do you think they'd say? What would they focus on? They'd focus on the sore head, right? They'd focus on the sore head. They're not gonna say nice people in central Montana, details of 10, right? Well, they might, but here's the point. Oftentimes the media and our public conversations and ourselves we often focus on the exception to the norm rather than the norm. There are beautiful, powerful things happening in every one of our communities every day. You know, students get together and study for exam and get B plus, right? That's fantastic. There's beautiful things happening, right? So what it means is we need to start to focus on the gap, understanding that and why, because what we focus on becomes our reality. And so if we're only focused on the red arrow and the concern, we start to see some of those iatrogenic or problem effects occur, the misperceptions. So we start to understand that perception is everything. I'll say it somewhat tongue in cheek, but perception is everything because 
what we perceive to be real becomes real for us in its consequences. Remember this? If we're perceiving young people, like the, the, the young person I mentioned at the very beginning, through this lens is a dark lens of, you know, you know, kids these days, right? They're all at risk, right? Um, then, then we're going to create some of those self-fulfilling prophecies. In positive community norms, we recognize that if we touch any one part of the system, it will reverberate out into all the other parts of the system. So we're going to need to have a portfolio that integrates all of these. I believe that most of you on this call do something similar with your work in terms of having a comprehensive approach, right? It's not just the individual, but it's also working with the data and looking at families and schools and, and workplaces and, and communities and policies. Why is this important? When positive community norms, the, the misperceptions of the norm occur across this ecology, across this social ecology, across these systems. Here's an example. The actual norm is that 84% of, of the students in, in this particular um, survey reported never having ever tried marijuana. So that's a lifetime use measure. So that's the actual norm. Is it a problem that 16% have? Of course it is. It's a huge problem. It's, and the way we're gonna address it is by growing the green arrow growing the 84% to be 90 and 95. But here's what I want you to see. Look at the misperceptions across all these other layers. That 65% of students are misperceiving and thinking most students have tried it when most 84% have not. And 63% and thought most adults had tried it, most had not, I don't have the data here. 77% of parents think most students had tried it when in fact 84% had not. Same thing with teachers and school staff, right? So hit pause here for a second with me, people. Here's what's important on this. These misperceptions drive the public conversation. And so you can hear, I don't care which community is, it is, let's pretend it's your community but if these misperceptions are left unchecked, it's gonna be this drumbeat in the background of, you know, kids these days, everyone's doing it. How do you know? Well, talk to the, the teachers, they know, they're with them every day. Well, how do they know? Well, talk to the parents, they think everyone's doing it too. So everybody thinks all these kids are using at a much higher rate than they actually are. These are all examples of how the misperceptions start to compound across the system. So when we're doing our work, ultimately, it's not enough just to come in and focus just on the student, the individual students in the classroom. We have to be working with the entire environment, right? It's a really important point here. Again, another big point for environmental approach. Because what happens is we often overestimate the amount of risk and underestimate the amount of health. And so with this, misperceptions of norms become like a hidden risk factor, similar to many other risk factors that we saw in, in the data and, and have published about. That if we leave this misperception just floating around in our community, our prevention efforts cannot be as effective as if we were to correct this misperception. Why would I say something like that? Here, here's an example. Here's some data where we see that 85% of the high school students in this 10 community cohort reported not drinking, meaning using alcohol less than monthly, meaning that, that's researchers speak for this being true to the survey, meaning not had any alcohol. 85% not drank. However, 48% misperceived and thought most had. So what's the big deal? The big deal is those students that misperceive are five times more likely to drink than those who do not misperceive. Misperception of norm is not neutral. It's not benign. It's a risk factor. So accurate perceptions is a protective factor. And that's what we continue to, 
talk about with our work. This is one of our big, big ahas. That correcting misperceptions of norms is, is, is critical because it grows the protection in the environment and in the community. So one of the questions we would ask if we're working together is, so where are your gaps? We can look at that in the data. We, we have to ask those questions in terms of the actual norm and, and the perception of the norm. Here's an example statewide in Wisconsin with work we did around child maltreatment. 70% of Wisconsin adults agreed that um, strongly agree actually improving the well-being of children is, is important for healthy communities. So there's your norm, 70%. 30% did not strongly agree for whatever reason. They would have either agreed or neutral or disagreed, right? However, 72% of these folks didn't think most other Wisconsin adults felt the way they did. Hit pause here for a moment. We're talking about child maltreatment. 70% say, yeah, I think we need to um, improve the well-being of children and families because that's at the heart of our community. That's going to be the heart of, of well-being and strong communities. But I don't think they think that way. I don't think most others think is in the way that I do. This is a pattern we see again and again and again across issues, across issues um, and, and topics. Yeah, I support the health and I believe in it, but I don't think they do. This is a problematic narrative, especially if we're trying to pass policy, public policy, and we think most others would not support it when in fact they would. So we see this again and again, but you could come out with a, a normative message and do some marketing with, with something like this um, that you see on the screen, promoting that positive norm. We see it with safe sleep, for example. A couple things going on here. Most parents, 70%, this is in West Virginia, in terms of talking about safe sleep, you know, said babies should only sleep in the safe, the approved cribs and bassinets and, um, you know, to, to keep them safe at night. However, so 70% agreed. However, 83% of parents did not think most other parents would agree. And 97% of home visit providers didn't think most parents would agree. So here's the next layer, people. This is fascinating. Parents are misperceiving other parents. And those of us in the, the, the helping professions are misperceiving at even greater rates. This is something else we see. And it makes sense if you think about it. a lot of us were focused on the risks. And so we think that the problem is even more prevalent than it is. But caution, think of that narrative we might create, that false narrative. So much of our work has to be correcting our own misperceptions of our own team and coalitions first. Um, here's a very strong norm. 99% of West Virginia parents strongly agree that it's never, um, that their child never experienced abuse or neglect, right? A primary prevention message here. Very strong norm. And there was a misperception with it. So we can connect this with the different levels of, of prevention, you know, the primary, secondary, tertiary levels of, of prevention, which, um, you know, primary is where we're going to focus most of our efforts with students that have not exhibited engaging in that risky behavior. I say students or, or people, depending on, on your audience. The selected would be for those um, with the risk problem behavior and then targeted for those that have that, that chronic behavior problem. So this is more of, a, of, of like treatment, right? Um, so we can look at the primary, the selected and, and the targeted ways and we can have different normative messages that, that would work with that. So here's an example of a, a primary message, um, not use, right? Choose not to use. So this is a, a primary um, prevention message going out to that, that majority of the population. Um, this would be more of a secondary type of a, um, a message, a, um, a selected message where students may be drinking in certain occasions and trying to look at a reduction, a harm reduction of that drinking. This is also known as an injunctive norm. It's disapproving 
of the behavior. It's not talking about how many are actually doing that behavior. But then there's um, ways that we can expand it out in the environment as well. And we could talk again in terms of many of you have heard of like sticker shock. There's other ways that we can do this from a norms perspective. And, and in this case, looking at the fact that the majority of um, adults disapprove of high school drinking. And so that becomes the pro predominant message and becomes part of helping to enforce policy. Here's something too then from a, like a, a tertiary or treatment perspective that if, if students are struggling with anxiety, um, and this is from Oakland University in, in Michigan, um, that most students would want their friends to let them know if, if, if they're anxious or depressed, that they, we wanna intervene and help our friends if they're struggling. So there's different ways. Again, this is a normative message. There's different ways that we can communicate. So we come back to this question in, in terms of questioning our own perceptions of norms and asking if the positive exists here, right? And we do it in this way. We're gonna uncover the positive because we believe it exists. We have data that it exists. We're gonna measure these gaps across the ecology of different audiences. And then we're gonna find ways to strategically challenge those misperceptions in the environment to increase health. That, that's the essence of, of what we're looking at doing. We're asking, what do we wanna grow in our community? What are, what are those key returns? And so um, I'm gonna introduce one other thing here in terms of the green arrow to go, to, to go deeper. Um, we, we mentioned this, um, again, I'm intentionally re-emphasizing some of these things. Risk and protection live side by side, we're focusing on the protection because there's often misperceptions of the risk, right? We're gonna look at what we can do to grow the hope as a way to offset the concern. But the hope and the concern live side by side. In our third part of our series, we're gonna strategically work with how do we communicate hope and concern with our data, working with data like these that, that I had shown. Spoiler alert, we're gonna come through the same cycle right, to get the results that, that we seek. We're gonna ask what's in our green arrow. We're gonna keep coming back to this basic logic model. So with that, I'd like to introduce one other concept that I think is really important. And then I'm gonna open it up for question and answers. And it's, this, it's something else that grew out of the science of the positive around what's known as hope. Because all of public health focuses on and delivers hope. When, but why would we, why would we want to look at hope? And what do I mean by hope? One of the things that, that we look at is that hope is also an acronym for healthy outcomes from positive experiences. How many people have heard of hope, healthy outcomes from positive experiences? We've started a center at Tufts um, University Medical Center um, in um, and have, have more um, information that, that we can provide about that there. When we talk about public health 101 in terms of the risk and protection, one of the things that we can do is we could look at the ACEs research and start to look at hope. How many people are familiar with ACEs? You're either an ACEs trainer, you've been to ACEs. Yes or no, are you familiar with, oh, this is great, you, you folks are, um, Again, just, just flooding the, the chat box here with, with, um, with tons. Yeah, lot, lots, of, lots of familiarity with it. Great, this is great. I, um, I expected, yes, perfect, good. Then um, I wanna take your ACEs work to a next level here with, with sign of the positive. Here's what we know about ACEs, right? Um, um, Uh-oh, I don't mean for my, my Zoom meeting to crash here. Here's what we know about ACEs with the Adverse Childhood Experiences Study that, that occurred like 23 years ago, um, is that a toxic environment, toxic stress for, for developing children literally reshapes the architecture of the brain, right? And I know there's people in this Zoom meeting that can explain this much better than I. But the bottom line is we then have that same brain with us as we grow up, don't we people? 
And then as adults, what happens is, is we're making certain choices and having certain reactions that reinforce these, these experiences, which basically then um, culminates in all sorts of adverse health outcomes. And you can see those on the, on, the, on the pyramid here. The bottom line is the more adversity in terms of toxic environments, toxic experiences that a young person has, the greater likelihood that they're gonna have um, these ad adverse health outcomes at, as an adult. Okay, this is what we've known. So we're sitting in the back of the bus with some of the work that we're doing at the CDC. And I turned to one of my colleagues and I said, well, if adversity, at, if negativity reshapes the brain, wouldn't positivity do the same thing? Wouldn't it also have that ability to transform the brain? He said, well, yeah. So building on the science of the positive approach, if ACEs represent the red arrow we're trying to minimize, positive childhood experiences would represent the green arrow. So we then started to engage in this research uh, with support of um, Casey Family Programs and the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. And our initial paper was balancing ACEs with hope, right? And you can see that here. And you, I, again, I can provide links to all of this. But essentially, we moved on from the ACEs study to, to now building off that Wisconsin study that I had shown you with some of the earlier data. And we started to include some positive experiences in the, in the statewide data systems known as BRFIS, the Behavioral Risk Factor Surveillance Systems, right? We started asking about PCEs, positive childhood experiences, along with the ACE modules. We did this in Wisconsin. We're now doing it in several other states. Here are the exact questions that, that we included. These were the positive experiences. Felt able to talk to a family member about feelings, um, family standing by them in difficult times, participating in community traditions, having a sense of belonging in high school, felt supported by friends, had at least two non-parent adults who took genuine interest in them and felt safe and protected by an adult in their home. So we added those. And then one of the most, one of the papers that we published about a, a year plus ago now is in uh, Journal of American Medical Association. And it basically started to look at, what if we look at positive childhood experiences, PCEs, and adult mental health and, and, and depression, re relational health? Here's what we found basically. The greater number of PCEs you have, the lower likelihood you are going to experience um, depression and poor mental health for those that had ACEs. So bottom line is just like the bigger ACE score you have, the greater likelihood you're going to experience negativity in terms of health outcomes. The higher PCE score you have, the greater likelihood you're going to ex, um, mitigate those very experiences and have positive experiences. And, and they're, it's quite significant. So if we look over here on the, on the right, for example, for those that have um, six to seven, so this is the number of ACEs on the bottom, zero, one, two, or three, number of adverse childhood experiences. So this would be a higher ACE score on this side. But if we look at um, those with six to seven positive childhood experiences, look at the reduction in depression and poor mental health, even with those with extremely high ACEs. And then you see um, more for those that have three to five and, uh, and, and same with um, the zero to two. Bottom line is increasing positive childhood experiences, even in the midst of ACEs can, can result in reducing those unwanted effects. So our adversity does not explain us. We're so much more than our trauma. We're so much more than our ACEs. There's so much more going on. So the bottom line for us is when we look at doing this work, we start with spirit, move into the science, then bring in the action for, for positive returns. And so that's the, the essence of, of the work that um, we've been doing with, with science of the positive around positive community norms and now around hope, healthy outcomes from positive experiences. And so for that, I'm gonna um, 
invite um, Taylor to, to come back in and we can look at some of the reflections of things you've learned in, in the chat box. And um, there might be some time for some, some Q&A as well. Thanks everyone. Thank you so much, Dr. Lincoln-Bach. This was great.